let's go to rule number four then, and that is the variations in CICA ratios reflect both acclimation responses and adaptation differences. We see that C3 plants differ in long-term balance between supply and demand. Oh, there's naturally occurring variation in CICA. Some of that is genetic. Some of that is environmental. So at this point here, I have two terms up there that may or may not be familiar to everybody, so I'll ask the biologist to help me. I have the term acclimation and the term adaptation. Will a biologist help define for the rest of the group what the difference is between adaptation and acclimation, or between acclimation and adaptation? Yes. Uh, the correlation between CICA and the carbon discrimination you're talking about air, weight, that is the Yes. Okay, that was expressing percentage. So I was confused. Percent? Yes. Okay. So that's oh, that's a typo error. What Julia is referring to would be if this is... Ah, uh, I know what happened. It's per mil and I moved the label in blue to cover the last part of the discrimination. Sorry about that. I will correct that in the next year's version. So, so discrimination is going to be measured uh, what's in the plant relative to the air. I could have done that very same graphic with carbon isotope ratio. And you'd see it go from about minus uh, 28 to about minus 18. So that 10 would be analogous to about a minus 18, and the 20 would be analogous to a minus 28 in carbon isotope ratio, going from a positive to a negative. So going back to the original question, what's the difference between acclimation and adaptation? It's a... Stephanie. Um, an acclimation is something, adjustments an individual can make within its lifetime to its environmental surroundings. Um, like you can get acclimated to elevation. Okay. From elevation and adaptation is um, a genetic trait. Good. So adaptation is a genetic feature. It's a set of characteristics that are defined by uh, the, the genome that relate to um, a set of qualities. Acclimation is a phenotypic term. It's the ability to express different phenotypes. And, and actually, acclimation is a form of adaptation because you might have a narrow acclimation and a white acclimation. So, Roxy, the next time somebody says to you, well, I moved to Berkeley and I adapted to my new environment, you should say, dude, you went through gene therapy? Whoa! <laughs> Okay, we don't adapt, society might adapt and adjust, but that's a very loose use of the term. So this is an important thing to keep in mind because uh, plants have this ability to uh, do a lot of acclimation. But one thing turns out to be really cool. If you are a plant that has a very negative carbon isotope ratio in year one, and I come back in year two, you still, have a very negative carbon isotope ratio. And the best way we make these comparisons is not in an absolute sense, because there might be acclimation, but in a comparative sense. So you're looking at two, four, six, eight, 10, 11 species that we looked at something like 30 years ago when we first started to get in this business. And we went back and looked at those very same plants a few years later, and the rankings among species stayed constant. That is an important observation. And that is, there are a series of plants, there are some plants that always have low CICA ratios relative to other organisms. There are some plants that always have high CICA ratios relative to other organisms. And the scheme in ecology, the effort in ecology, is to understand are there patterns associated with these variations in isotope ratio 
that deal with lifestyle, with, with history, with competitive interactions, and so forth. So how might we apply this information? Other people, early on, so I'm trying to give you some of the older literature, said, well, if there's that kind of variation that Elringer just described, what if we took a road trip? We all like road trips. And so let's head from Canberra. Let's go into the interior. Let's uh, go north, come out in the, in the tropics. And on each site, we're going to give you the range of values in carbon isotope ratio that we've measured and the mean. And what you see is that the mean carbon isotope ratio changes with precipitation. The lower the precipitation, as we go from right to left, the more positive the carbon isotope ratio. Or, if I was going to make that discrimination, the lower the discrimination. First interpretation is going to be what happens to CICA as you get into drier climates? Closures to Matamor. Closures to so in the supply demand function, you could have the demand function staying constant, but the supply rate is going down. They might be coordinated in some way, but there's a differential effect of lowering supply. And that's a very general phenomenon as you go from wet to dry environments. Because now I'm going to ask you, as a group, to study this slide talk to the person next to you, and in about a minute, I'm going to ask you to interpret those slides, and I'll just randomly ask somebody, but it won't be Roxy, because I've already called on Roxy today. <laughs> so, take a look at these data. The data are good, just tell me how you're going to interpret them. Talk it over among yourselves. So, I'm going to ask Karina the first question. Why am I seeing different values every year in the valley than I am on the slope? Oh. Uh, I'm so the amount of water is in there. Bingo. Wet wash, dry slope. Simple observation, but clearly a distinction. Why do I want to pay attention to this? Because I have a whole community out here which is doing global carbon cycles and they want to have one value for a landscape. No, the landscape is heterogeneous. It's got wet sites and dry sites. Carbon isotope ratios vary, and you can calculate how much the CICA varies based on that. Okay, second question. Uh, Emily, why does it change from year to year? Probably sunlight constant, but rainfall clearly is different. So this tells you that there is a long-term site difference, wet sites versus dry sites, and that both sites are sensitive to changes in the year-to-year -year water availability. That there isn't a lot of memory in the system from year to year. So if I go out and I collect leaves every single year, I can get a long-term indication of how the plants have responded to the climate. But man, I am lazy. I do not want to do that. I'm going to go listen to John Roden's lecture tomorrow and hear, I don't need to go collect friggin' leaves all the time. I'm just going to go sample a tree ring. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to be incredibly lazy. I'm going to sample the tree ring over the course of the year. And I'll get my integrated behavior over the history of that, of that tree. So this is part of the power of the isotope technique shown here in these observations. Now, this observation, I'll help you through. Basically, this is a uh, graduate student, is now a very well-known full professor in Canada, Rob Guy. And as a graduate student, very early on, he did one of the most interesting pioneering studies, and the data are good. No question about the data. But Sean and I will argue with Rob 
as to whether or not the interpretation in his paper is correct because his interpretation of those data was incorrect. But he didn't know something because his study was done in 1980 and Graham Farquhar's theory didn't come out till 1982. So he had this very incredible observation that as he took plants, sort of plants we might find by the shore of the Great Salt Lake, and grew them in media with different salinities, from low salinity to high salinity, that the carbon isotope ratio of those plants changed. Okay. He interpreted the data as, oh, there's a change in photosynthetic pathway as we go from one environment to the next. Not an unreasonable interpretation, because I told you there's a graph of what C3 plants have as their isotope ratio and C4 plants. So that was his interpretation. And it turned out that was not the correct interpretation. The correct interpretation is that as you go from low salinity, low water stress, to high salinity, high water stress, the plants progressively close their stomates. Okay. Chris. Uh, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that plants alter their photosynthetic rates, not pathway, but rates, independent of smaller conductions under water stress. Correct. So, so we will come to that. Okay. Good point, sir. Ask me that in five minutes. Okay. So there's another observation which is sitting in these data that I think is remarkably cool. What's the isotope ratio of the plants when they're grown under very non-saline conditions. Let's look at the graph. Minus 34? That doesn't fall in the range of what I would expect to see for plants. Oh, this was a greenhouse study. Oh, this was a greenhouse study where they had supplemental CO2. Cool observation. He didn't know it at the time. But uh, Rob is a, a fabulous guy, and I think this is one of the most remarkable data sets that uh, um, helped spawn the field. So I've given you some examples, water stress. Uh, what else is going to cause a variation in uh, plant carbon isotope ratios? What else could you imagine? Temperature? How would temperature do it? Okay, so not temperature itself, but VPD. Yeah. So the drier the environment. Good, that's an important factor. There's Chris. also minor effects on proviscal kinetics temperature as well. Yeah. So infinitesimally small that I can't measure it on this scale. That's going to be my initial. With isotopes? Yes. I mean, Actually, I'm trying to drive for environmental ones, but I'll accept that genetically there will be rubisco effects. In the back here. Light. Light. That's a big one. That's the one I was looking for. Why light? Because it turns out that as you decrease the light, the plants progressively open up their stomates. Well, why? It turns out to be a very simple explanation. Plants that are in the shade often do most of their photosynthesis during a sun fleck. Now, if the sun fleck is going to come around and it's only going to last for a minute, you want to have your stomates closed? It takes time to open up. And so instead, the stomates are relatively wide open to take advantage of that sun fleck. So that leads to a very important sampling observation in the northern hemisphere. If you're, or anywhere place, if you're going to sample plants for carbon isotopes, you have to choose the same part of the plant to sample all the time. And I have a basic rule that I use that I mentioned to group one, the fantastic team, um, the best team. Uh, and that is that you sample on the south side of the plant and you sample on the outside of the south side of the plant. That's the maximum exposure. And you say, well, you know, I'm just going to sample on the outside of the plant. 
then I want you to go to one of these trees here on campus, and there's some, some nice uh, columnar trees that, that have leaves at low elevation that you can sample. And as you sample around the tree, you'll find that there's a two per mil variation in carbon isotope ratio from the south side to the north side. And so it might be minus 28 on the, uh, 26 on the south side and minus 28 on the north side. So you've got to be consistent. So the challenge is that if you bring the sample back, I don't get to ask you that question anymore. You, ha you should state in your methods, I collected plants when I, on leaves. When I collected leaves, I collected on the outside, on the south facing side. Now, of course, if I'm in uh, Argentina, I'm going to sample on the north side. Is there a question in the back? OK. Yes? Does the wind play a factor in there? Wind probably does not play a factor. No. No. Nope. Uh, through evaporation, yes, but wind directly, no. Uh, there is another factor that we have not described. And now I want you to think aquatic. What kind of factor might affect things aquatically? It might be more apparent later on. What about a plant that's underwater? Okay, let's say the plant's underwater. Hmm? Speed of the water. Uh, how many of you guys are hot tub fans? Okay, forget your name. Kelsey. Kelsey. Uh, let's say you go into a hot tub and it's incredibly hot, okay? Uh, and you turn off the jets. Does it cool down? Oh, I guess you have to do it to know. <laughs> if you can create, if you can create, if you can create a boundary layer, and that water is hot, it'll seem cooler. The analogy here is that if there's CO2 in the water and the water is still, then the CO2 concentration gets drawn down. Okay? If you have water that's moving, then the boundary layer stays low. Okay? Now, you can do this experiment. John Raven and others, if you look at the literature 10 to 20 years ago, people have done this experiment. But I want to tell Chris and others You've got to understand the literature and these mechanisms because I can tell you when people were sampling aquatic plants in the 70s and 80s, they described half the aquatic plants as having C4 photosynthesis. They didn't have Crohn's anatomy. They didn't have elevated carboxylase. They, they didn't have any of the other features, but they had carbon isotope ratios that were very positive into the C4 range. These plants were essentially CO2 starved. And what John Raven did in a beautiful series of experiments was to say, let's take a series of plants, the same genotype, we're going to grow them underwater, still water, moving water, very rapidly moving water. And as you decrease the boundary layer, they became more C4-like. That's that CO2 gradient we're talking about. Now instead of being the gradient from the outside of the leaf to the inside, it's from the outside the boundary layer to within the boundary layer. So you can get that depletion. Yes? Can you clarify what you mean by the boundary layer? So if I was to take a leaf, okay, there is a layer of still air above and below a leaf. And that the size of that layer of still air depends on the size of the leaf and the sort of shape of the leaf. But let's say we just were dealing with the linear leaves. So I'll have that kind of a boundary there. But if I was to take having a smaller leaf, it'd have a much smaller boundary layer. That boundary layer is a layer of still air. And the only way gases, whether it's CO2 or nitrous oxide or uh, water, gets across is by diffusion. So we have two processes that are important here. 
One is going to be diffusion. And the other is going to be turbulence. If I have turbulent transfer mixing, the laws of diffusion don't apply. So in the CO2 moving from the outside of the leaf to the inside, it's moving by diffusion. But it also has to get through the boundary layer. In most cases, the boundary layer on the outside is pretty small. So if I'm a CO2 molecule moving in, I've got to move across the still layer then across the stomate, stomates, those two barriers. Okay. If you want plants to grow faster, you want to make sure that the boundary layer is not small. I mean, the boundary layer is small. Okay, does that help? Okay. Question here, and then Kelsey. So is this applicable? Your name, Maria? Uh, no, Cecilia. Cecilia, sorry. Is this applicable to uh, streams and lake waters? Like CO2 degassing will be fast in uh, moving water? Oh, yes. It's, it's true for, for virtually all processes. Kelsey. Well, so I guess I was just wondering why wind doesn't have an effect if it, like, would the wind disturb the boundary layer? Or, like, how would you... you so, wind, so the boundary layer is going to be proportional. So the boundary layer is going to be proportional to wind speed. And shape. Is the wind speed, like, is that... Is that just not measurable as an effect? Typically not. Uh, the only time I've ever seen it affect isotope ratios in plants is in the aquatic systems. Right, that's kind of why I wanted to yeah. 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 But uh, for those of you that, that, that might ask whether or not plants change their boundary layer characteristics, I just ask you to go out and look at the oak leaves that are outside on the trees next to campus or I mean next to the biology building. And you will find the outside leaves are finely dissected to reduce the size of each leaf le piece to uh, reduce boundary layer. And if you go to the inside, I've exaggerated this a bit, but most of those lobes are not as deep. Kelsey. Are there environments where it would be more beneficial to have a thicker boundary layer? Like if you're worried about losing yes. water? Yes. You should take my plant ecology class. And I'll tell you exactly. Um, the simplest solution? <laughs> if, if a leaf can reduce its absorptance, then it's better to decouple from the environment by having a higher boundary layer. So if I told you that lots of plants that have white leaves have big leaves, in environments where everybody else has small leaves, that's a biophysical explanation. And it's just working out the energy budget equation. Chris. Um, first of all, uh, Tom Givnish has written a lot about that. Tom Givnish has written about this, G-I-V-N-I-S-H. Um, but my question is, uh, can we separate the CO2 that is in equilibrium with the atmosphere and that which is coming from the soil? In River and like this. If I have time, that's between 11:45 and 12. Okay, because there, because a lot of isoedi species are cam, but they're aquatic and submerged, and there, there's evidence to suggest that they're getting most of their CO2 from just from the soil, as far as from the soil and lake beds. But in intertidal zones, when they're exposed to more uh, to open air, they switch to C3 and and open their stomates. So we have a series of really cute, neat adaptations where plants, if we'll have time, we can talk about this, where plants switch photosynthetic pathways, depending on the environment. Okay, let me move on.